Well, that's crazy to even watch. Uh, it's been a long time since then, but unfortunately, uh, I still work on the balance. So I may stand like right over here for a bit. Uh, just to you know, kind of go through that and give you a little bit of background about who I am. Um, I grew up probably about an hour north just outside of Hill Air Force Base. And so I watched the jets fly over every single day. And for me as a little kid, that's what I wanted to do. I knew it. And so I remember, you know, trying to find out what I needed to do to get there. And I found out about the academy. And so I wanted to go to the academy so bad. I remember, you know, getting into my junior year and going and talking to the, the counselor. And he's like, yeah, I'm sorry. He's like, it's, that ship sailed. They've already made their appointments. I just was devastated. But, you know, life goes on. So I graduated from high school. And then after that, then I uh, volunteered for my church for two years in Japan. And then after that, came back home and decided that medicine was my future. So I started going and taking all the pre-medicine requirements that I had to, and even went back to Japan and worked at a hospital there for three years or for three months. And then after three months, came back home and just as so often happens in life, just a chance meeting totally changed, you know, my, my future. I remember I was sitting down in uh, one of these uh, elective classes that I had to have and I met an old friend and he started telling me, you know what? He's like, I think I want to fly. He's like, I'm, I'm, I'm taking this, you know, these ROTC courses. I said, well, what do you mean? I mean, it's only, you know, you got to be top of the top. And he's like, no, he's like, there's a lot of Vietnam you know, era pilots that are retiring. And now's a great time to come in. And in that moment, suddenly I went from, all right, I'm going to take the MCAT here. I'm going to start doing this to changing everything. And I went in and talked to the ROTC unit. And it was probably about a year later that I graduated from the University of Utah's ROTC program. And then was fortunate enough to get a pilot slot. And then I was off to Pensacola, well, first Defense Air Force Base, Oklahoma. And this is the glamorous life of, you know, just learning how to fly. You literally, this is the cockpit of the jet right here. You sit here and I've, you can't see it, but I've got a, uh, a plunger that's over there. And that's my, you know, that's my throttle right there. And then you, you fly. I flew hours and hours on that chair. I remember finally, you know, then it comes to start flying, you're going up there, and I loved it every single day. I mean, people talk about Oklahoma, and anybody here from Oklahoma? All right, good. I can't say too much, but I mean, you know, there was nothing in Oklahoma. I mean, there was this little tiny, you know, town, Enid, Oklahoma, where we, we lived, but then once you got in the air, I mean, it was nothing as far as the eye could see, just, you know, fields and fields. And so we would go up there. It made it pretty easy to fly because when you were doing, you know, you, you're learning how to do split S's and Cuban 8's and Immelman's. And you would just line up on these lines and it made it pretty easy. I remember we were going out there to, to go learn how to do loops, which is pretty much the basic, you know, one of the most basic things you can do. And so my instructor had, had lined me up and you have these boxes in the sky that they, they give you. And you've got a lower altitude down here. That you cannot break an upper altitude up here that you can't go above and the anyway because there's guys up above you you know training as well and guys below so you cannot drop below there so uh, thank you so anyway i'm up there and this is my day to go do loops and i remember you know I, I i thought you know i'm gonna crush this i mean i just knew it and so i got in the jet and then of course my instructor goes and shows me how to do it he's like all right full throttle you know come around nice 4g pole come up around and you know i thought no, this isn't that hard at all. So I got in there, you know, I thought, all right, I got this. I, I watched Top Gun, you know, like 10 times. It had to count for something. So I got in there and I, you know, started, gave it full throttle, nice 4G pull. And I remember one of the biggest things is your, it's easy for your wings to kind of, you know, come off and, and then you end up going into something else. So I, I was making sure I was nice and good. I remember looking through the back of the cockpit and then I just brought my head back inside just for a second. And I just heard my instructor just kind of chuckle. And the altimeter was just tick, tick, tick. And I'd forgotten to pull the, the, the throttle back. So I'm coming on the backside. So it's looking like a lollipop. I mean, I'm just going straight down. And I know that I'm going to bust that. And if you bust that altitude, it's an automatic failure. I mean, there's nothing, you know, you, you failed that flight. And if the instructor might have expected me to do the uninspected, he might have been prepared. But there was no way I was going to break that. And so we're not even, we're not even in G suits yet because we're not supposed to be pulling that kind of G, but I pull back on the stick as hard as I could. And there's, you know, what we call graying out. And, uh, and I pulled back so hard that suddenly the color goes, all the blood's going down from the top of my head, down to my legs. And my vision just goes, whoa. 
And I was, I was doing everything I could. There's certain maneuvers you do to try and make sure that the blood stays up. But all I had was this little tunnel and I was doing everything I could to make sure that I could stay up. And I looked inside and sure enough, I did. And I look over and I had blacked out, which is where you totally lose conscious, conscious by instructor. And I mean, I, I, I looked at that and thought, oh no, what do I do? I don't even know how to land this thing, you know? I mean, I mean, flying this jet, I didn't know what to do. I mean, do I just keep going on and doing some of the other tricks that I'm supposed to do? Or do I just go? And it was probably about 30 seconds later when he came to. And when he came to, he, I won't go into what he said, but I'll just say he let me know in no uncertain terms that, uh, you know, I need a little work on that loop. And so it, it did. I mean, I, no doubt. So I eventually finally got that loop and, uh, you know, went on to solo and uh, got out of there. Oh, maybe it didn't come up. Oh, yeah, go on to solo. And then from there, I got orders to go to Pensacola, Florida. And it's, it's even funny to look at this. I mean, I know all these guys. They try and look so hard. I mean, they're, no, I know these guys and it's crazy. Anyway, but Pensacola was absolutely awesome. They're doing this joint training thing where they would take Air Force guys and we would go down and fly with the Navy. Navy guys would go and fly with the Air Force. And I loved it. I mean, especially coming from Oklahoma, there was water everywhere. And I, you know, and if I wasn't flying, I was windsurfing. That was my other great love. And it's basically just taking a wing and, you know, flipping it up on its side. I was going to get a photo of, oh, I'm way ahead. I was going to get a photo of like those guys in Maui that shoot off the top, you know, and do these backflips, but that, that wasn't me. I mean, this was me and this may look cool, but it really is not that, that hard. Uh, you're, you're basically, once you, you've got your harness and they've got, you know, your strap back here and you just lean back. And once you're in that balance, I mean, you just fly and, and I loved it. I, there were the islands out, out there just off of Pensacola and we'd go out there and sell around the islands. <laughs> and then there was these, this old civil war fort, civil war fort, and the waves had broken down. So it was nothing more than really ruins, but at high tide, it was high enough that you could actually sell over the top of, of the, the walls and just look down inside. It was amazing. I mean, there was, you know, ma huge manta rays. There were fish all over, eels. You know, for a Utah boy, you know, I mean, I was just in seventh heaven. I hadn't seen any of this kind of stuff. And so I, I, I loved going out there. One time I saw a huge, you know, jellyfish in the middle. I'd sailed out for probably about an hour in the middle of the ocean. Nothing's around. Massive jellyfishes that were probably about this big around, just pure white. And, uh, you know, anyway, it was, it was just fantastic. So I'd been talking a little bit to my brothers and my brothers, you know, I had a 21 year old brother, a Chad, and then a 17 year old brother, Darren. And so they both wanted to come on out. And I said, well, come on out. I'm going to get, you know, transferred from here. So before that happens, come on out. So they came on out and of course they wanted to windsurf. And windsurfing has a, a pretty steep learning curve. You just don't hop on a sailboard and, and start learning. Even though it is easy once you've got it down, it takes a little while before you kind of get the knack. And so uh, they were having trouble in the, in the wa deeper water. And so I went to these little tiny islands that were not too far away, you know, out there. And the water was all probably about like this. So that way, if they fell off, they could, you know, hop back on the sailboard easily enough and then start sailing and then it made it easier. So we were out there and we'd rented a small kayak so they could, you know, uh, get out to the islands. And we weren't out there for very long when all of a sudden, you know, out there on the water, you know, clouds started to form. And the first thing they teach, you know, pilots is weather because you're always in it. And as I saw these clouds start to form, I told my brothers, look, we got to get back. And they're like, oh, come on, you know, we got plenty of time. I'm like, this isn't Utah, you know, here we see thunder cells that are way off. And we're like, all right, you know, we, we better start moving. I said, I've been in the sky before where these things build and you can't out climb it in the jet. You end up having to go and divert somewhere else. I mean, it's that powerful. We, we can't screw around. So we got gathered up our stuff and we started to head back and we had a headwind coming at us and that's, you know, nothing you can't do, but you know, you got to jive back and forth and anybody that windsurfs or, or skis normally that's a, a, a fun thing i mean you know if you you lean on the board the board comes carving around and then the cell just comes swinging around you grab the other side and then you're on the other direction and you're doing that back and forth but it's time consuming and to make matters worse right before i got on this cell board my sandal broke and i, I was just so angry because you adjust these straps so you can get in and out of them really really easy and so, uh, you know, this now I tried with my barefoot, you know, but I didn't have any surfer wax, you know, to get, kind of put on the board. So my foot was slipping and I, I, I couldn't do it. So my brother gave me his sandal 
and his sandal was just like that much wider. And every time it would just stick and I was just angry by it. But we were making our way back when pretty soon, all of a sudden, this storm is building up on top of us. And there were other people out there, you know, fishing, you know, just boating, but they all had something we didn't have. And that's, that's a motor. So as soon as things started getting bad, even though we were the first to start heading back, you know, they start their motors and they're soon passing us by and the sky just goes dark. And it wasn't much longer after that, that <clears throat> the first of the lightning starts coming down. And I, I really didn't know what to do. Our options really were not that good. I thought, okay, well maybe I can flip this thing around and sell back to the islands and then lay down on the islands, but that's not much better. A, a lot of times people that get hit by lightning and die, it doesn't even necessarily hit them. It, it hits like way over there, but then you know the electricity comes through the ground and your heart is just that little tiny impulse. All it has to do is just interrupt that and you're dead. And so I thought, nah, I, I wanna keep going. And I thought, well, maybe I can take down you know, the cell and just lay on the water. But to be honest, the, the land was in sight. It really was not that far. And so I thought our best option was to try and just push on. And so we kept pushing on. But my brother said that the, the hair, I mean, on their arms, their necks, would be standing up. Pretty soon there was like a taste you know, that, that they had. And it wasn't much longer that I went jibing in front of them on one of my last tacks. And they said that suddenly there was just a loud boom and their ears just started to ring. And there was a flash that went all the way around. And my brothers looked back and that's when they saw my body, my board just smoking. And it, it had fired every single neuron I had in my body. And so even though, you know, I'd been hit, you know, obviously stops my heart, sorry, stops my heart. I kept sailing on for about another five seconds and just then finally got off course and then just drifted and then slipped and fell underneath the water. And the lightning had hit the top of the mast and then that metal clip that you have here, it had arced off into that and then, you know, come out my arms and my legs. So my brothers, they go into shock, you know, they jump out of the kayak. They're like, we got to save him. And they start swimming as fast as they can, but they get about halfway and they're like, but we need to get help. And so they go back to the kayak, they jump in the kayak, they start paddling. They're like, but he's underwater. And so they jumped out three times. They did that. They don't like me to tell that part, but you know, they were just in shock, plain and simple. Fortunately for me, somebody on shore saw it happen. And when they saw it happen, you know, they ran down to the dock of this marina and they went, ran down there and they're like, Hey, you know what? Somebody's been hit right now. And there was a boat that just barely come in there. And they're like, we're not going back out. I mean, are you crazy? Lightning was still just boom, boom. This storm ended up knocking out the power in a 50 mile radius around. I mean, they estimated three strikes per second were coming down in that area. I mean, it was a big storm and we just happened to get caught out there. So these guys were like, uh, uh, we're not going out there. And he said, if somebody doesn't go out there, you know, he's dead. He's already under the water. But if you don't, if you don't go out there, you know, he's dead. And there were three guys that were on a boat and these three guys, I could spend the rest of my time talking about them and it would not do justice. Uh, I tell people a lot of times, I, I was talking to a high school group the other day and I said, you know, the blue angels and they didn't know who the blue angels were. So I started putting in a slide. Uh, I forgot to put the lightning strike in there. My bad. Uh, but the blue angels, they're a flight demonstration team and they're based out of Pensacola. That's their home. And every once in a while we would come and see them fly and they were like gods to us. I mean, the things that they would do in their jet, I remember as a, you know, Lieutenant, I'm working in a, uh, in the tower one day, I remember they were doing their performance and they come screaming across and, you know, solos inverted like this. And then he's got second solo up on top of him. And I'm probably about a hundred feet up and I can see through his cockpit. I mean, he's got no room to go, but these guys were amazing. Air Force, I mean, Thunderbirds, I'm Air Force. I love the Thunderbirds, they're amazing, but the Air Force would never allow that. I mean, there's a 500 foot minimum, you do not drop below. And so anyway, on this boat, two of the guys were members of the Blue Angels team. These two guys right here. This is a Marine pilot, Bruce Shank. And then there are two flight surgeons. So on this boat, not only were two of them, you know, Blue Angel, on the Blue Angels team, but two of them were flight surgeons, Navy flight surgeons. Incredible that you'd have that kind of luck. Uh, to make matters you know, even more in my favor, uh, Pat McMahon, and this is Paul Miller over here, uh, they he, Pat, he ended up getting a slot, which was pretty prestigious with the Blue Angels because of his training in emergency medicine. And so they immediately were like, we're out. And they flipped their boat around. And even though lightning was still you know, driving all around, they cruised on out to come and get me. They ended up getting the Navy and Marine Corps medal 
uh, which is the highest medal you can get for bravery during peacetime because of their actions. Can't say enough. I really couldn't. I have two daughters now. Uh, they, I thought, Bruce, Pat, Paul, is there any way I could make that work? And they're just, it just didn't work. So my oldest daughter, her middle name's Navy, you know, even though I'm Air Force, just because I want her to know for the rest of her life that we owe so much to them. Uh, this was actually at the ceremony uh, where they um, received it. But anyway, uh, you know, they come cruising out to me and Pat, you know, he jumps into the water as soon as he can. And he dives in there and the first thing he's thinking is, I got to grab this body and we got to get back. But he doesn't realize that at this time, water's completely filled my lungs. And so he goes and he undoes the only thing that had been holding me up. And the only thing that had been holding me up was that sandal that broke. Had my sandal not broke, just like right before we got on that, I wouldn't be here today. I'd be at the bottom. Anyway, Pat jumps in the water and he goes and he grabs that strap and he undoes the strap. And as soon as he does, the body just starts to sink. And he's like, he said he sat there for a few moments going, what do I do now? You know, I just lost the body. But he quickly dove down and he starts diving, but he, he can't find me. I mean, the sky is black. Even though you got crystal clear water, if there's no sun, you're not seeing anything. And he dives down there and it's just dark. And he keeps going down further and further. And as he gets down lower, he, he does a couple circles, but he can't find anything. And finally, he's out of oxygen. And so he turns around, he starts coming back up. And as fate would have it, he happened to pick the same line. He had, you know, dove down, but he had passed me and then came back up. And my sandal just happened to brush across his face. And I had fingernail marks in my calf from where he had grabbed on. He was like, I didn't know if I was going to go down with you or not, but I was not letting you go. And he kicked and he finally got me to the top. And then once they got me to the top, Bruce Shank, uh, I don't know how many of you guys lift. You can tell, you know, uh, yeah, I'm big into lifting. But anyway, he weighs 200, you know, I weighed probably at the time about 185 pounds. You know, I've got water in my lungs. And with one hand, he reaches down and curls me up and then brings me down on the back of that ski boat. I mean, I'm sure he had a lot of adrenaline going along with it. But as soon as he did that, Pat was already in the boat and they were off. And they took me back to, you know, the, the harbor and then they rushed me up and there was a tiny little cell shack where they would hang cells to dry. And all over, I mean, rain is just driving down. There, were, there was about two inches of water just all there. There had already been uh, an ambulance that had been called, but this, you know, Pat, he knew exactly what to do. He said, they're not going to have a portable defibrillator and they're not going to have, you know, epinephrine. The, anyway, some of the things that he needed. So he called right away and he said, we can't move him. You've got to send another ambulance right now or, you know, or you're just going to die. So they kept doing the CPR, kept it going. My brothers, meanwhile, they were still upset that they didn't get picked up. But anyway, they made their way back uh, to shore. Finally, they got to shore and then they fought their way, you know, to get, get back to where I was. And then when they got there, my brother, you know, he really doesn't have much he can do. And he's just like, I think I'll just try and pray. So he said a prayer for me. And then about that same time, the paramedics come, they've got all their equipment, they got all their stuff. And they're like, all right, you know, uh, you know, we're here. And at that moment, you know, both those doctors were like, is this a good idea? You know, he's been hit by lightning. He's been under the water, you know, for four to five minutes. You know, who knows what's happened? And we've been doing CPR on him now for almost 30 minutes. This might not be a good idea because there's a, I mean, there's a chart. You can look at it. I mean, every minute that ticks off, your chances of being brain, and I'm not saying, I, I'm, my wife says I'm just as dumb as I ever was. Who knows? Probably is. <laughs> But, you know, they were like, is this a good idea, you know, going and bringing this guy back? But they were like, all right, my brother was there and he's like, please don't give up. If you give up, he's dead, but give him a chance at least. And so he's like, all right, everybody clear out of here. And then they, you know, gave me the shot with the adrenaline, and the epinephrine and all that stuff. And then they got out the paddles and they cleared everybody out. And he said, we tried to push as much of that water off as we could. But there was just water standing all over. And so we put you on some towels and they had me up a little bit. And then he stood on a big stack of towels. He said, and I was fully expecting to get shocked when I hit you with that, you know, with, with that defibrillator. But he cleared everybody out and he says, all right, clear. And he did it. You know, at first there's nothing. And then clear, do it again. And then finally there's a little bit of a, of a, a heartbeat. The third time, finally I got a regular heartbeat. And with that, they rushed me off this tiny little clinic that they had there. But that clinic wasn't enough to handle me. And so at the same time, there's a helicopter up above that is trying to get down to me. But that same storm, it's stopping that helicopter from getting down. So he's, he's tried multiple approaches and he said that he was finally low on fumes and they came down and they were finally able to land. Broke a few rules, but they, they were able to finally get it down. 
grabbed my body, and then they hurried up and they rushed me off to University of Southern Alabama Medical Center. And then it was there at the medical center that for three days, you know, I'd flatline, they'd do something, they'd, I'd come back. I'd flatline, they'd do something, they'd, I'd come back. But on the third day, I'd finally flatline seven times, and they, but the real kicker was the respirator that helps you breathe, it was at 100%. I'd gotten some weird bacteria that you get from uh, I, I, eating raw oysters or something like that. And sorry, this is kind of probably me, is it? Oh, came off. All right. You good? All right. Okay. I'll try and talk loud too. Who knows? Anyway, so, you know, I'd gotten some bacteria that you get from eating raw oysters. And I didn't eat raw oysters or anything like that. But it must have been in the water, and I'd ingested it, and then being that low, it just allowed that colony just to, to grow. And so there was no oxygen coming in there. And so the doctors were like, all right, we need to go and get the family, come in, have, the, have them come and say their goodbyes. And luckily, my commander was there, and he's like, are you sure he's going to die? And they're like, yeah, you know, it's just a matter of time. As soon as they're done, we'll pull the plug. He's like, well, don't pull it yet. He's like, just type me up a letter that says Nolan Porter, Lieutenant Porter, imminent death. He said, and with that, I can hurry up and get him retired, and that way his wife can get better benefits. But, you know, if, we, if he dies right now, it, it's not going to work. So they hurried up, and they typed up that letter, and I've still got some of the orders that, on it that say Nolan Porter, imminent death. And you know, I don't think I'm spoiling it by saying I didn't die, but I didn't die. <laughs> but it wasn't like I was immediately out of the woods. And I wasn't, it wasn't for a long time that I finally talked to doctors, and they kind of told me, you know, the reason. They said there was a technology that they didn't even have three years before you got hit. And this medical center was one of the few that invested in it. And even though your lungs wouldn't open up all the way, it would, it would vibrate just a little bit so that you would get one avioli here and one over here and one over here. And it was just enough to give you enough oxygen that you can talk with me today. But I didn't know that for years. Well, anyway, it wasn't like I, I didn't come out of my coma for another, what, 15 days. So by the time I come out, I wake up and I don't know where I'm at because my last memory was I got through with the flight and I was coming home, turning the doorknob, and then suddenly I'm here. And I went back and tried to find out where that flight was and it was two weeks before I got hit. So not only is there two weeks there, but then I'm in a coma for two weeks. There's about a month that's just gone. And so I remember coming to and they would tell me the story about, you know, being hit by lightning under the water, saved by blue angels. I'm like, this is bad. I just need to close my eyes. I'll have to wake up to a new dream and woke up again, same story. And it wasn't until the third time that I woke up that I finally believed it because I'd never felt pain like that before. Uh, it was just everywhere. And there had been so much heat and energy in the lightning that when it hit me, it, this is a terrible analogy, I know, but if you've ever put a hot dog in a microwave and, you know, see, I mean, that, that was it. And they knew that was going to happen. And so they, that's why I have, you know, slices all over. They, you know, cut down both sides of my legs, my arms, and then my body just swelled during all that time I was in a coma. My ears were, you know, just inside my head. My eyes were just two dots. Uh, my dad said that my skin was just like hard plastic of a Frisbee. And so when I came to, they had my arms up like this, and then they had them all wrapped. And they were changing bandages. And the first thing they were saying, like, you know, can you move your hands? You know, move your hands. And I remember looking at my hands and just trying to move it. I mean, just everything with, that I had and nothing moved. And I, I can't tell you the frustration, but the frustration slowly built into fear and panic as I realized what that meant. Because I wasn't, I, I never cared to live like to 100 years old. That wasn't my, my goal. I, I, I wanted to be able to live a life that was full of doing things, of, of energy, of, of you know, just enjoying life. If there was a sport, I played it. You know, if it was in the outdoors, I did it. I hiked, bike, climb, all these things. And now, what kind of a life was I going to have? And uh, every day I had to go and get these things clean. They would go and they, I think there's a, well, I'll get to it in a second. Every day I would have to go and get these things cleaned. And because uh, the, the infection was pretty bad. And there was a burn unit that was down there, but it was on the bottom floor. So I, every day I'd have to go from the ICU, you know, down to the burn unit. And to this day, I, there's a smell that the burn units have that I, I just, I know it instantly. And uh, I don't think I've, Anyway, I, I still hear of people that get burned and my heart goes out to them because I know what they're going to have. There'd been a, a club that had gotten on fire about two weeks before I'd, got, I, I'd gotten hit and five guys had gotten stuck down in this basement and they couldn't get out. 
and their burns were horrific. I mean, just all over their face, their back. And that's who was down there. So the, the burn unit was pretty packed. You had to wait for, for a room to open up, and then they would go and they, they would, you know, debride you, which debriding is just cleaning. So they would go in there and they would take it. And I, I told the lady that I was, you know, had been in physiology and anatomy, and I kind of knew it. I'd seen cadavers. She says, oh, so you're, you're okay with this? I'm like, yeah. She's like, well, yeah, well, let me tell you a little bit about this. Well, this is this, and this is this. And she grabbed this. I can still see the tendon right there. She grabbed that tendon, she says, and this pulls all these fingers. And suddenly, I wasn't so okay with it as I thought. And she must have recognized that on my, on my face because she kind of put it down. She says, maybe we won't do this yet, you know, and put it away. And I, I wasn't. I mean, I'll, I'll admit it. But anyway, from there, you know, I would go back up to ICU. And in ICU, I just didn't see anybody. And it probably wouldn't have been that bad except for the pain was just always there, always there. I couldn't get away from it. And slowly, you know, I started to go downhill. But one of the few things that I had was they would write on my on me with a pen uh, right here. It was a little felt pen and they would mark like how far did I, can you feel this? I'm like, yeah, I can feel it. And I was actually, that was coming back pretty good. And I remember finally they got down somewhere around my knee and I came up one day and the doctor said, all right, he's like, you ready to do this? He's like, you're doing great. I said, absolutely. You know? And so I remember laying there. And he came up with a pen and he says, all right. He says, can you feel this? And I was like, I can, I can totally feel it. And then all of a sudden he stopped and he looked at the nurse and the nurse looked at him and he's like, I haven't written on you yet. He had dropped the pen. It had fallen down these sheets and my whole world. I was like, no, I felt it. I felt it. And he said, all right. He said, just, just a second. And he grabbed it and he says, can you feel this now? I said, yeah, I totally can. He says, I'm not writing on you. And he said, I'm sorry, Nolan. And he said, you know, and then they put up the sheet and they, you know, he's like, can you feel this? No. Can you feel this? No. And I wasn't lying. I'm a realist. I'm one of those people that I want to know the facts. And I, I was feeling that as they were going along there, I was feeling it. And when he did that, by the time they took down the sheet, I was all the way back up here on my thigh. And I remember that night just going to bed and I thought, you know, everybody had been telling me like, ah, oh, you got to have a great attitude. You got to be positive. But in that moment, I was about as low as I could possibly be. And I remember laying there. Uh, sorry, I remember laying there and, uh, and I just didn't know what I was going to do. And I never cried. I hadn't cried for years and years and years. And suddenly, you know, I'm, I'm at this position where tears are just coming out. I mean, I'm just bawling like a, a kid and, uh, sorry, I'm probably screwing up that mic. And I remember just sitting there and all of a sudden the cleaning lady comes in and I can't do anything. I mean, I can't even reach up my hand, like to, you know, wipe the tears off my eyes. I can't do anything. I remember so many times nurses coming in, they're like, just let me know if you need anything, you know, well, I, okay. You know, I can't do anything. I just lay here. Can't push the button. You know, like you're telling me. And I remember finding the cleaning lady coming in during this time and she sat there and she, you know, got the garbage and then she goes to walk out and she went to walk out. She got right at the door and then all of a sudden she just stopped and she came down and she sat next to me and she sang like one verse of some gospel song. I don't even know the words. I don't know what it was. And then she just stood up and she says, you know, God loves you. And then she just went on her way. And I mean, that lady wasn't a doctor. That lady wasn't a surgeon. I mean, she, she was a clean lady, couldn't do much. But in that moment, I cannot tell you what that meant to me just to know that I wasn't alone, that somebody actually cared about me. I mean, it, it, it you know, I won't say that from that night, I didn't have any more crying nights. I, I still had other crying nights, but it helped me along the way. And it was probably about a week after that, that finally a doctor came and he put a sticker on me. And it was one of those, had one of those anti symbols and it said, you know, pain. He said, you're not going to feel any pain anymore. You know, I said, great. You know, how are we going to do that? And he said, we've had a limit on you because you're, you're taking more morphine than anybody else in this hospital. He said, but all your energy is going towards fighting that pain. And he's like, I think that's why you're not healing. And I was like, great. And from that moment on, it wasn't like I started, sorry, put that up there. It wasn't like I started doing really, really well. But I started getting a little better. I mean, I remember the first time I finally was able to see any movement in my fingers. I remember the first time I was finally able to touch my, you know, both of those together. Something we don't even think about. The first time I was able to touch my nose, I darn near cried. Have you ever gotten a, an itch on your face, you know, or something, and you can't do anything about it? I remember just laying there like, just don't think about it. Don't, it'll go away. Don't think about it. The more I did, it drove me crazy. And finally, I was like... I got to do something about this, but there was nothing I could do. 
Uh, it was a great lesson in patience, but slowly I did get better. And then they flew me to Hill Air Force Base uh, and on this great big medical plane they had, really cool. And then from there, you know, I went to McKady Hospital. I was in McKady for quite a while. And then, no joke, I was in there one day. I'd been sleeping in, you know, I'd been there for about a month and I'm in, the, uh, in my room. And I literally saw, you know, the, you know, the walls just start to move on me. I was like, I, I can't do this. So I, I took my wheelchair back out and I'm, I was out and, uh, you know, I, I got nighttime. They're like, you got to go back in. I'm like, can't go back in. They're like, you got to go back in. I'm like, I cannot go back in. I'm sorry. There's no way I can go back in there. And uh, that's when I found out there are hospital rooms and then there are hospital rooms. I suddenly they're like, what are we going to do with this guy? I remember they were complaining. They made some calls and then they put me in a hospital room that no joke was probably from that second divider right there all the way back. He had a king size bed, glass window looking out there. I was like, I would have thrown a fit a long time ago had I known this was here. You know, it was unreal, but it came with a psychiatrist the next day. So, uh, and the psychiatrist, you want, you want to tell me about what happened last night? And I, I didn't know. I was like, I, I don't know. I said, I it just, everything started to close. And he says, I think we need to get you out of here. He's like, you're not scheduled for a bit, but I think we need to get, get you out. He says, I think, you know, you'll still have to come back. He's like, are you going to be willing to come back for physical therapy? And I was like, yes, 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 yes. You know, if I can get out of here, yes. And so from there, I finally got out. And then every day I would come back, you know, to physical therapy. And it was a long road. And I didn't realize it at the time, but I was slowly going downhill. And I remember finally being there and uh, a therapist coming up and talking to me. And they said, you know, it's, I hope you know that it's going to be a long track. I'm like, I know, I, I'm there. I'm coming up every day. I'm trying. And she says, I know. She goes, but you know, you have, you know, only you know if you're doing everything you can. And I was, I mean, I, you know, I just, I just didn't have everything, but I didn't see the other side of it. You know, I had buddies all over that, that, that cared about me. My brothers that I lived with, you know, every day they'd get home from skiing, you know, and, and they'd want to come talk to me, but you know, they're like, oh, it was a great day skiing. Oh, you should have seen the powder. I didn't want to hear that. You know, they're out there playing games, you know, and they're coming back from a basketball game. Oh my heck, you should have seen it. We were so close. I taught you how to play basketball. I don't want to hear this. And it just was like stabbing me. I had buddies that, uh, one buddy that flew a Super Hornet and he, and he still flew his jet into the Air Force, uh, into Hill Air Force Base. And right where the, the missile pods are, he would open it up and he'd slide his skis in there and then he'd close it up and they'd come out and see me. And I, at fir first couple times, it was kind of cool. But then I'm like, he'd be calling and be like, I, you know what? I'm busy. I, I have something. I'm, I was just pulling away from all my friends. And I didn't really realize it. Now, at physical therapy, if you've ever been there, there are stories galore. If you think your life's bad sometime, you know, just take a trip there. Uh, and sometimes it's easy to get, not, not to say that they don't deserve, you know, to complain, but it's easy to start talking about all the bad things that are happening to you. I'm not sure I'm doing this wrong. Sorry. Oh, can you hear anything? Okay, good deal. I, I'm like, they're probably not even hearing me. And they're just too nice going, yeah, you're good, you know, but... All right. So anyway, you know, I was going along this track when one day I was going in there and I, I wanted to talk to Rich McKenzie and Rich McKenzie was a stud. He had been a high school swimmer, a state champion, uh, just a really cool kid. And then finally for his graduation trip, he wanted to go backpacking trip with his brother in the San Rafael swell. So he goes with his brother, they're hiking, backpacking, and then they, you know, camp next to the river and he's a swimmer. You know, he wakes up, stretches in the morning and he goes and he runs and he dives into the water. But he doesn't realize that a foot and a half below the water, there's a sandbar. And in the split second, his whole world changed. He broke in his neck somewhere around C3, C4. And that's about the time I'd met him three years later. And so finally, he was able to kind of move his arms a little bit and, you know, do a little bit like this, but, but not much. But every day he would go to school at Weber State, and then we'd come back, and then he would work out as hard as he could. I remember sweat just pouring off this kid. And then he would go, get on the bus, and he was gone again. He had to have a strap to kind of keep him, you know, from falling down. And so, oh, no, is that my... Okay, good deal. I thought my time, I'm done. All right, so anyway, I'm talking to, you know, Rich McKenzie, sitting down next to him, when, you know, and I'm thinking we're going to talk about how life are, how bad our lives are. You know, you were going to go off to college. You were going to go, you know, do great things. I was going to be a fighter pilot. You know, look at how bad our lives are. But I sit down next to the kid, and instead, he turns to me and he says... Man, Nolan, gosh, we are so lucky. I remember looking at him and being like, uh, you know, lucky? I was hit by lightning. You know, you snapped your neck. In what world is that lucky? 
I, I, okay, you know, and I wanted to hear the rest of it. And he said, you know, I've heard your story. He goes, it's amazing you're even around. He said, and two weeks ago, he said, I found out that if I would have snapped my neck just like one point something millimeters higher, he said, I wouldn't be able to do this. And I'm like, great, Rich, you know, you can go and do this. And I wasn't thinking, you know, but I just said, ah. And he goes, I know, you probably understand. He goes, but hear me out. He said, there is an adapter that you have. When your arm goes spastic, which means, you know, the muscles atrophy and you have nothing else left. Apparently, the tendons that are in here, you can't grip like this anymore. But if you have enough muscle, you can grip and you pull it as tight as you can. And it allows you to then go like this and to pick things up. And then you bring it down and then you open up and you let it down. And they make these special adapters that then inside of that adapter, and he was going on about, he's like, you know, he's like, I'm going to put in a razor. He's going, I'll be able to shave myself. He's like, I can put in a pencil. I can start writing. He's like, I can put in a spoon, a fork. He goes, no, I'll be able to feed myself. And it was like somebody had just smacked me across the face. Because here I was, I could do way more than that. I mean, I could feed myself for a long time now. I mean, maybe I didn't have great arm strength, but I could do way more than that. And yet I was all the way over here. I'm so frustrated and upset and angry with myself that I was all the way over here on the spectrum in misery. And here was Rich. Rich, this is all he had. And yet to him, the world was bright. He had all the folk. I mean, he could do anything. He was telling me about this van he was going to get where he's going to pimp out the wheels and, you know, and get this stereo system in there. I mean, he was just talking about all these things that he was going to have in the future. And at that moment, it, it gave me enough clarity to step back to go that something's not right. I, I, I've been doing everything. I've been coming here to therapy. I've been, I thought I was doing what I was supposed to do, but something is not right. And I remember going home that day and I, I didn't even know what to say. I remember talking to my brothers. I'm like, I don't know how I got here. I don't even know where I am. And I don't know how to get out of here, but I need your help. You know, can you help me? And they're like, absolutely. What do you need? You know, let's come up with some ideas. I'm like, I don't know, but I want, I want some excitement in my life again. I'm not dead. I mean, I, I, I want to do things. And they're like, all right, well, let's start making a list. And they made a list and half of them, you know, were just crazy. I remember one of them was uh, rollerblading. And they're like, all right, you know, I'm like rollerblading. And they're like, no, listen, you came to us for ideas. I'm like, all right. And they're like, if you, you know, you can stand and I could, I could, I could stand like this, but you know, no balance. I mean, it's like stilts from here up, you know? And so I was like, all right, maybe that'll work. And he's like, we'll have one brother on this side and one brother on this side and we'll pull you. It ended in a mild concussion. It was the worst idea ever, but at least we were trying. We were doing something. We're like, all right, you know, we're doing it. So then we moved on to something else. And there were a few others. I wish I had the time to tell you, but it was just bad. But they finally, I do? Oh, I do? All right, good deal. Okay, then maybe I can get to it. So, but you haven't even heard about my falls yet. I got, that's got to take like at least 30 minutes. All right. Anyway, so then another one was they were going to go rappelling and my, my father was a firefighter and he's like, I remember sitting there and watching him go and they're like, there's no reason you can't go rappel. I'm like, I can't rappel. And they're like, why not? You used to do it all the time. I'm like, all right, maybe I can. So we go up there, they hook me up and sure enough, I can. And I started going down there and I was like, this isn't too bad. And then I got a little feel for it and I could kind of hop it wasn't pretty but i mean i was i was going back and hopping and coming back down i got the bombers i mean i highlight highlight that i had that year i mean it was just it was just amazing i actually did something like just incredible i remember coming home that night and talking to my wife and telling her i was taking off my socks one sock won't come off and i can't get up finally pull three toenails came off with that sock <laughs> I didn't realize I had these sandals. If you notice in the video, I had to wear these, these slippers, these house slippers, because I would put on shoes and I, I couldn't feel if a little rock or a, you know, my sock got twisted wrong. I mean, I'd end up wearing a hole, you know, right, right in my foot. And I didn't even know it. And I, and I had ulcers at that time of the video. And so, you know, I had these sandals that I was wearing. And as I was rappelling down, my toes were just back in. So, you know, it, great idea, but we, we made some precautions after that. But finally, they hit on one that absolutely changed my life. And that was biking. And the same thing again. I'm like, I can't do biking. You know, and they're like, look, would you just cut it here? Hear me, hear me out. My brother worked at a bike shop and he's like, uh, we can clip you into the pedals and then we can gear it so that it's in its lowest gear. And I'm like, my legs don't work. And he's like, your left one, and it's true, my left one, I could push down. I couldn't bring it back up, but I could push down. And he's like, if I gear it right and I push down hard, you push down hard, it, it'll come back up. And if you can't, we'll be there behind you to push you. And so I was like, all right. So we went there and we started doing it. And 
you know, it didn't work at first, but my brothers would be on this side. I'd fall this way. They'd prop me up, push me again. I'd fall this way. They'd prop me up, push me again. And it got to be the thing that I looked forward to every single night. Every single night, I'm like, you know, can we go? I was like the family dog, you know, what? You know, I want to go, you know, take me out. But I needed them to do it. And so finally got to where one brother would, you know, walk behind me and he'd push me, you know, and then I'd, I'd go along and finally got to where I could do it by myself. I remember them running, you know, on each side of me, just going like, you're doing it, you're doing it. And I had enough strength that I was able to go all the way around our block and come back. And then every night, finally got to where one brother would just wait. And I was going around there, you know, coming around and things were getting, I mean, like I said, I, 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 I look forward to it every single night. And just the process of doing something just made my life so much happier. You know, I started being more engaged with people. I was talking to people, you know, telling about their, my, my buddies that were wanting to come out and ski. I'm like, come out and ski. I'll, I'll wait in the lodge, but come out and ski. And then one day I go into physical therapy. And so here's my wheelchair. And I come in there and I come ro rolling in. And I'm chewing gum and I, you know, I go like this and I'm like, ah, right, so what do we got planned for the day? I remember the therapist just looking at me and she goes, what did you just do? And I'm like, I'm seeing it was the gum and I'm, you know, spitting this gum out and trying to throw it away. And she's like, no, not the gum. She goes, what did you just do? I was like, I, I really, I was trying to think. I said, what do you mean? She says, what's your legs? And I said, did you mean this? And she said, yeah, that. She goes, how long have you been able to do that? Because they had told me before, sorry, we can't you know, we can't keep focusing on you trying to walk. Your muscles just aren't coming back. That's not, not going to happen. We need to focus on this, but somewhere in biking, something happened. And those muscles, my hip flexors later found out, uh, that allow your leg. Anyway, finally found out my hip flexors that allow my leg to swing up. You know, they had been missing, but somewhere in that process, they came back. And she says, I'm not saying you can walk. I'm not saying that she says, but there's a chance. I think that maybe we could start, you know, doing some things with therapy. That was all she had to give me was just that little bit of hope. And I fought for everything. I remember just, they had these, uh, uh, gymnast bars, you know, and I would spend hours on those things till my legs were just shaking. And then finally, I remember me and my grandpa, we were in Walker at the same time, <laughs> you know, going with those. And then after that, we went to crutches and then we had crutches and then went to these things called loft strams that you have on your arms. And then slowly I got to where I had these hiking poles and I remember using those things. And, I, and every time I would walk, I would, I finally thought, you know what? I don't need to have both of these poles. I can just do one. And so I would just always walk next to a wall. That way I always had a wall. And I'm like, well, I don't need this pole. And so I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm pretty good. So I'd always walk like that. And there'd be a few places where I'd have to walk. And I mean, it was like, I was, you know, uh, a motorcyclist, you know, gap jumping, you know, 50 cars or something. I'd be like, I got this. I got this and I I'd make it. And I finally, you know, make it across and get over here. Pretty soon I was going, I got accepted to BYU's MBA program. I was like, all right, I'm going to go, I'm going to do this. And so, uh, I was not ready for it. I should have still been in my wheelchair. I don't even what I was thinking, but I thought I can do this. You know, I don't, I don't need to, but I didn't want anybody to know that I was hit by lightning. Even in that, when I watched that, I don't know if you noticed the bandages that were on me. I wanted everything gone. I wanted all my scars gone. I wanted to go back to the way things were. I did not want to remember this at all. And so, you know, on my legs, I had all those scars, you know, taken off, you know, but I couldn't feel down there when they got to my arms. I remember they had this one removed and I woke from the surgery and the pain was so bad because it stuck to the muscle. They had to scrape it off. I was like, scars are cool. I can do that. No, I'll, I'll keep that. What was I thinking? But, and who knew that they would actually go scared. Skin, same skin color, but anyway, uh, so I remember going to the NBA program and I was trying to, you know, to figure out how I could do it without them knowing. So I would take my poles and I would collapse them. I had a backpack and I would put them in my backpack and then I would enter and I would always walk next to this wall as I was go, as I would go up and I take the up the elevator up. But then finally one day I thought, you know what? I don't have time for therapy because I didn't, I was so busy with school. I had no time for therapy. And I thought, maybe if I walk down these stairs, you know, I can get some therapy, you know, that, that'll be something I can do. And so I remember getting there next to the, you know, to the stairs. And, and if anybody's been in the Tanner building, there's this great big atrium. It's just open five floors up and these stairs that go. Ch -ch 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 -ch. I thought I got this, you know, so I had it, you know, I had the, the stairwell right here and I started going down. And I'm just doing fine. And everybody knows the rule, right? You walk on the right side, you know, but I'm looking down and there's this kid that doesn't know the rule and he's 
coming up and he's coming up fast. And I'm like, oh, no, come on. He's got to look up. He'll look up. He's got to look up. He's not looking up at all. He's charging as fast as he can up these steps. And I'm like, I'm not letting go. It's not going to happen. And then finally I thought, you know what? Maybe if I just step out here and then I let go, he can go by and I can reach back and I can grab that real quick, you know? And I'm like, I got this. I got this. I mean, I've been doing all these other gap jumps. I mean, this is, this is easy, you know? I'm like, all right, all right. He's coming, coming. And I let go like this. I remember he went by and I was like, I can't believe that worked. And I went back to grab it not realizing that my backpack was all the way out here and somebody hit the back of my backpack. I remember going, and that was it. And I was off. And you would think, okay, yeah, you'll just go down one flight. No, 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 no. I went down beyond the next one, down the next one, and I was on the third one when finally I rolled and I was able to stop my, in fact, there were some other people that finally grabbed me and stopped me. And I remember just sitting there like, what just happened? And then the whole place just went in an uproar. I mean, it was dead silent. And then everybody starts clapping. I just, you, you got to own it in those moments. I mean, I just stood up and was like, all right, all right, you know, here I am, you know, and then went off. But I learned how to fall. And I learned that after that, I really didn't care that much. And people finally found out that I was hit by lightning and it helped so much because I was going in for surgeries all the time uh, that I had to have. And my instructors finally found this. Why didn't you tell us? Why didn't you? you know, I'm like, well, you know, I just was trying to make things happen on my own. And sometimes you do need to talk to other people. Now, frustration, I mean, uh, there were times where I thought that I owned frustration. Frustration, you know, anger, disappointment, all those things. I thought that I had the monopoly on that. But I don't. Every single one of us goes through that. Now, it's a spectrum. Some people are down here and all they need to do is get a little clarity. They need to just step back. Look at their life, see what's happening. Other people are a little further down the line. And maybe those people, they're having some tough times. And maybe they need to write down like what, those things in their life that are positive, those things that are happening, those things that are good in their life. For me, I actually had to have a book. And I had a book and I had to take photographs and I had all the things that made me happy. I had a picture of there of my wife. I had a picture of my kids. I had a picture of, uh, oh, I'm talking about the book I have now. My kids, I had a picture of sunset. I have a picture of uh, flowers. The things that make me happy, happy, because I still have to pull that out. I'd love to say like, oh, I'm never, I'm always in this happy area. No, I'm not. I still come back. But wherever you're at, if you're not engaged, if you're not actually trying, it means nothing. You have to add, be honest with yourself and say, am I really trying? And if you're not, you may actually have to go and talk to people. You may actually talk to you know, those that are around you and say, I don't know how I got here, but I don't want to be here. And look at your life in different angles. And it may be, I'm not saying that everything is going to turn out fine. I would love to feel my feet. I honestly would. I looked at you rolling your ankles and I was like, oh, that looks so nice. I would love to do that. I would love not to have pain, but that's not the world. But that doesn't mean that just because we have these bad things, these hard times, that we got to live over here in this dark place, this terrible place. Rich taught me more that, that more than anything. You know, there are people that are, nothing's wrong with them, and they live over in this place. There are people that, you know, have, the flip side is, you don't have to have everything perfect in your life and be absolutely awesome to live in this place either. Success and happiness, it can happen to everybody. It, 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 you know, nobody just owns that. I, I'm glad I was able to be here. I'm not sure what my time is. Am I over or am I under? Or? I got five minutes of, okay, good deal. All right. I'll just kind of end up a little bit. I'm grateful that I can be here. Every day I go out and I talk to different people. And I think I do this as much for me as I do for other people. As I looked at that video, I remember a kid that was in a dark, dark place. He didn't ever think he was going to be able to, you know, to do the things that I do today. If he could have seen me walk, I mean, I don't walk good, but I walk. You know, kids, I never thought I was going to have kids. Hiking, biking, skiing, all the things that I loved, I told myself over and over and over. I'll never be able to do that. My list of things that I couldn't do were long. And it turns out most of them, lies. They, they, they end up being lies anyway. But I didn't know that. But it kept me from actually being engaged and actually doing things. And it's like, I'm not, like I said, I'm not alone. I mean, everybody's like that. Everybody's got their own little thing in their life. And sometimes you have to step back and be like, all right, where am I at? And it's not an easy thing to do. The, the truth hurts sometimes. I remember looking at that coming all the way up on my leg. I didn't want to believe that at all. 
If I could have just said, nope, that's not there. I'm all the way down there. I'd have been happy. There were times where I wished that it had never happened. Oh, well, yeah, you know, he wouldn't have told me. But he did. Anyway, I'm grateful to be here. I know they want a few times for questions in case there were any. But uh, uh, anyway, thanks for having me. Appreciate it.